action. And thank you for thank you for having me here today. Yeah, as Xinya said, today I'm not going to talk about my work on the quantum computing, which is based on a collaboration with Matthias and James, who are sitting in the audience. Um, today I'm talking, I'm going to talk about a completely different topic, which is jet physics, uh, most of the time in vacuum. And I want to talk about a construction of some jet observables that are made pure quark or pure gluon in a wide kinetic region. And this work is based on an ongoing project with Ian Stewart, and we're going to publish this paper very soon, hopefully. And um, first, let me explain the idea of jets. What is a jet? Jets are basically collimated three of particles. Like when we have high energy collisions, for example, E plus E minus collision or proton proton collision shown in this picture, we have some hard scatterings happening at the collision point. And uh, for a lot of times, we will have back to back partons produced. And those partons will have a large virtuality. And once they are produced, they will do a subsequent radiations because they have a high virtuality. And these radiations include some collinear radiations along the jet's direction or some kind of soft wide angle radiations. And after the kind of shower of these radiations, these partons will hadronize into hadrons like pions, protons, or kaons, and then they fly to our detectors. If we put a collaborator uh, here, we can collect some energy distributions among these particles, and then we can apply a jet finding algorithm, such as anti-KT algorithm, to define a jet, which is based on some recombination mechanism, like you just group these partons or these, these hadrons. And in this picture, I show you some CMS events, like these tracks just represent these high energy particles produced. And these peaks here just represent the amount of energy deposited into the detector. And in this case, we have sort of two jets. They're kind of back to back with a very large energy. And in the kind of eta phi plane, again, we have some kind of peak distributions representing these jets. And we also use jets in the heavy ion collisions as a probe of the quark gluon plasma. So the kind of original idea of using jets to probe quark gluon plasma is based on the jet quenching picture, which means when a high energy parton traverses the quark gluon plasma due to the interaction with the soft particles inside the plasma, the jets gradually lose energy. And as a result, we will see the jet's production in ion collisions is suppressed with respect to that in proton-proton collisions. And we can measure the nuclear modification factor. And we use those nuclear modification factors to probe some information of the quark one plasma, such as the transporter coefficients. But this process is very complicated in general. For example, like the jet energy loss mechanism depends on the uh, jet structure uh, for example, if the jet is very wide or fat, the quark gluon plasma can resolve the internal structures of the jets. And the quark gluon plasma will interact individually with each particle inside the jet. And as a result, the fat jet will lose its more energy in this case compared with the narrow jet. Like we, if we have a very narrow jet, due to the color coherence effect, the QGP cannot resolve the internal structure of the jets. So the QGP would think this jet is just one or two partons. And in that case, the jet will lose very little energy because I mean, due to the quantum interference in the colors again. So this would uh, kind of uh, lead to challenges if we want to analyze the experimental data. Because when we collect jet data from the experiments, we don't know which part is gluon jet, which part is a quark jet. So in general, uh, we have a mix of gluon initiated jets and the quark initiated jets. And these gluon and the quark initiated jets will, will have different jet energy loss behaviors inside the quark gluon plasma. This puts the uh, analysis of the experimental data more challenging from a theoretical perspective. So ideal, ideally, we would think if we can like separate quark jets from the gluon jets in the data sample, I mean, collected experimentally, that would be great if we want to use jets to probe the quark gluon plasma. And if I give you a data sample that is pure gluon, 
then we know um, how a gluon jet re responses to the quad gluon plasma. We can better constrain how a gluon jet interacts with the QJP, and similarly for the quark jet. So this really motivates us to think about how to kind of dis disentangle quark initiated and gluon initiated jets. And uh, as I said earlier, a typical jet observable would contain both quark contributions and gluon contributions. And from the experimental data, we only know the total distribution of these observables. But here we want to know the individual distributions and the individual fractions um, in the jets in, in the data sample. And uh, I just explained one motivation to study quark and gluon jet discrimination. Some other motivations include to better understand um, the QCD as a theory accounting for jets and improve the probes of the quark gluon plasma, as I just explained. And also, if we can separate the quark from gluon initiated jets, we can use these kind of individual samples to better constrain the pattern shower models or pattern shower generators, such as PCA or Vincia. And finally, for our friends in the high energy field, if we can separate quark from gluon jets, then we can increase the sensitivity in the beyond standard model physics searches. And the question now is, can we extract quark of gluon fractions or can we distinguish quark and gluon jets? And this has been studied a lot previously. And one common strategy is to use the stuck off factors in some jet substructure observables. So for example, in this plot, I show you some um, observable distribution in X. We have the quark contribution in blue dash line and the gluon contribution in red dash line. And uh, the idea of using stuck off factors is to look at the distributions in the tail region, like in this tail region. And from theoretical perspective, we know how the distribution will look like in this tail region. Like they have some exponential decaying factors and it depends on some log square terms like the stuck off double logs. But the coefficient of these stuck off double logs is different for quark initiated jet and the gluon initiated jet. For quark jet, we have the CF, while the CF is given by this, the kind of casting year for the fundamental representation. And for gluon, we have the CA as the coefficient, and the CA just equals to the number of colors in the theory. And then if we look at the, the far tail region, um, this difference in the coefficients of the Sudakov double log will lead to a kind of large separation between the quark and the gluon contributions. So this is a kind of a very popular strategy, but this strategy suffers from two disadvantages. So first, if we look at the distributions in the tail region in experimental data, since the distributions are tiny there, we will suffer significantly from the experimental uncertainties that can contaminate the disentangling, um, the quark and the gluon jets. And the second, this procedure is not 100% efficient, which means even though the, for example, the gluon distribution is, is exponentially suppressed here with respect to the quark distribution, they're still not vanished. You still have some remaining contributions from the quark, from the gluon contribution. And that's why we cannot reach to 100% efficiency in this disentangle. So um, this really motivates us to think some different ways to construct observables to disentangle quark and gluon jets. And here is uh, what we're going to uh, reach in the end of this talk. So by some constructions, we made the observables pure quark or pure gluon in a wide kinematic region. For example, in this plot, this is a pure quark observable, and we see the quark contributions in blue is now vanishing in, is throughout the kinematic space, but the gluon contributions to this observable starts to become zero in the starting at negative four, and beyond that, it's all zero throughout. And similarly for this pure gluon observable, so like the gluon contribution is now vanishing, but we have a uh, uh, a zero quark contributions in a very wide kinematic region. So this is the ultimate goal of my talk. And are, you, are, going to, are you going to specify what kind of observer you're talking about? Yes, yes. I'm going to construct them and uh, discuss like, okay. yeah, right. This is the goal of my talk. And I just want to highlight um, the results of my talk because we're going to go through some technical details. I don't want um, everybody lost. 
so it, it's better to have the big picture <laughs> from the beginning. Okay, so um, here is what I'm going to do in this talk. Um, I will tell you how to construct those pure quark and pure gluon observables. And that is based on a grooming technique called collinear job. So in the first part of my talk, I'm going to explain what collinear job is and what the jet mass is in collinear job is. So to do that, I need to gradually introduce some concepts. So first we'll start with jet mass without grooming. And then we'll, I will introduce grooming, which is, uh, we, for example, the soft job. And then I will define the collinear job in terms of the soft job. And then I will talk about some uh, perturbative calculations of jet mass in collinear job, which is based on factorization. And then in the second part of my talk, I will discuss how to construct those pure quark and pure gluon observables. And we're going to use the cumulative jet mass um, in the collinear job. And then I will show you some results from the next leading law calculation and also Monte Carlo studies. And then I will give a brief summary on my talk. Okay, so in the first part of my talk, I'm going to discuss jet mass and the jet grooming procedures. So Can let I us start. Question? Let sure. Can you define precisely what you mean by <clears throat> quark and gluon jets? If I have an energetic quark that radiates a hard gluon, is that a quark jet, a gluon jet, some mixture of the two? Okay, so what, what I mean is the quark initiate the jet and the gluon initiate the jet. Like, it, it, like right, the jet starts with a, a parton that has a high virtuality. And if that parton is a quark, then I would call that a quark jet. If that parton is a gluon, then I would call it a gluon jet. And uh, basically our procedure gives you a way to define quark jet and the gluon jet. I um, mean, I think you were asking about, say, higher order corrections to the hard um, cross section of the jets. Basically, that, you just. Yeah, that's. Sorry, go ahead. That's part of it. But if I think about you know, jets in the heavy ion context, um, mm -hmm. it's actually the interaction of the jet shower with the medium, which, which uh, really creates the. Um, which is really the full full um, expression of jet quenching. And so um, the identity of the initial hard parton is important only for the very initial instance. And then the whole thing becomes a little more complicated. So perhaps the identification of a quark initiated and, and gluon initiated is different in, in vacuum than in uh, medium, or at least has different impact on, on, on the uh, ultimate physics measurements. Yes, I agree with that. Um, yeah, in the little part of my talk, I'm going to talk about contaminations of soft radiations from the outside of the jet. For example, the initial state radiation and the multi-parton interaction in proton-proton collisions. And then I will also briefly discuss um, the, the heavy, ion, heavy ion collision case, which can be totally different from the vacuum case, but we were going to do that. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so yeah, let me talk about jet mass and the jet grooming procedures. So let, let us start with jet mass without any grooming. And the jet mass is defined by collecting all the particles inside your jet and take their form momentum and square that. And in the high energy limit, which I mean, there is a large momentum along the light cone direction or some Z direction, um, the jet mass can be written in this way. We have some very large longitudinal momentum along certain direction, and we call that the hard scale Q. And we will look at the jet mass in the region where the jet mass is much smaller than this large energy scale Q. And in this limit, we can analyze all the relevant modes that contribute to the jet mass in this way. So we will parametrize every particle inside the jet in this way, like they have some um, fraction Z for the longitudinal momentum, and they have some angles with respect to the kind of hardest, direct, hardest particle direction inside the jet. And this, parametrically, the jet mass with the scales like Q squared times Z times theta squared. And, and if we draw this line or this relation in this plane, like this plane includes log one over Z and log one over theta, we just have a straight line here. This blue line represents the measurements of jet mass satisfying these conditions. And uh, when, when this blue line intercepts with the Y and X axis, we have some kind of 
typical scaling behaviors in the modes. For example, this mode here is called collinear mode. It, it, the, the, the angle of this mode scales like mg over q. And uh, the energy, I mean, the p plus is a much smaller quantity here. And on the other side, we have a soft mode, like this just represents wide angle soft relations. So the angles are kind of uniform here. The theta is on the order of one here. And we just have very soft contributions because the mg is much smaller than q. And when under this condition, you can write the jet mass in this way. You have the large scale q times the plus component of the collinear mode and the soft mode. And then we can construct some perturbative formulas to calculate the jet mass distribution. And this plus sign here will lead to a convolution between two functions. Like one function is called jet function that accounts for the collinear mode here. And the other function is called the soft function, which accounts for the soft mode sitting here. And this convolution just represents these two modes are connected by this line of measurements. And in addition to that, we have the hard functions H that repre that's representing the initial production of some quark jet or gluon jet. Okay, this is kind of a intuitive picture of jet mass without any grooming. And now we're going to add grooming into this picture here. So the grooming I'm going to talk about is called soft drop. And soft drop is defined with two parameters, one called Z cut, the other called beta. And here is the following, uh, here, here is the procedure to, 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 to apply the soft drop grooming. So we start with a jet that is reconstructed using some algorithm, for example, the anti-KT with some radius R. And then we use the Cambridge Asian algorithm to recluster all the contents of the jet. And this CA algorithm will combine pairs with the smallest delta RIG first. So the delta RIG is basically the relative angle between two particles or two particles inside the jet times the Cauch uh, eta G, where eta G is the rapidity of the jet. So basically this algorithm combines pairs with the smallest angles first. And then we obtain a tree of particle radiations. And this radiation tree is consistent with the leading log branching history. So large angle radiations happens first, small, smaller angle radiations happens last. And then we just go through this branching history and keep removing the softer branch until this soft job criteria is satisfied. And this criteria says you take the minimum of the transverse momentum of the I and the J particles or, or parts, and you divide it by the sum. And if that is bigger than this, um, this quantity determined by the Z count and the beta, then um, the condition is satisfied. Otherwise, you're just removing the softer branch, which means the smaller of the PTs. Um, so here is the cartoon for this soft drop grooming procedure. And this is a radiation uh, tree of branching history we obtained using the CA algorithm reclustering. And uh, when we go to the first branching point, let us assume this condition is not satisfied. And this, the dashed branch is softer compared with the solid branch. So we just remove all the remaining parts in that dashed branch completely. And then we move on to the next branching point. And now let's just assume the soft job criteria is satisfied at the second branching point. And then we just stopped and we keep everything after that. So all the parts after the second branch are kept inside the jet. And then we just use the remaining stuff inside the jet to define any jet observables of our interest. Okay. This is a very intuitive picture for soft job grooming procedure. And let us look at how the soft job is represented in that log one over Z, log one over theta plane. And again, we focus on the jet observables uh, of jet mass in soft job. And again, the jet mass is defined by taking all the components inside your jet after the soft grooming procedure and square their momentum. And again, this can be written as the minus plus components. And to contribute to the jet mass in, in soft job, 
the particle has to pass the soft job criteria, which explained earlier. And here is the diagram. So the soft job basically is represented by this orange dashed line here. And this orange dashed line just represents this condition. Like the longitudinal momentum fraction of the, of the jet parton has to be bigger than the uh, Z cut and the theta to the beta power, like these parameters determined by the soft job definition. Um, but since we kept all particles after the criteria is satisfied, the kinematic space is here, does matter. They still contribute to the jet mass. So only these regions in this corner is groomed away in this soft job uh, uh, procedure. And now if we look at these diagrams, we have a new mode relevant here, actually two new modes. Like this collinear mode it also appears in previously, but these two, mo two new modes appear here. So one new mode is called collinear soft mode. This one happens at the intercept of the measurement line, which is the blue line here, and the orange dashed line here. Like this one is it's collinear, but it's also soft due to these conditions. And the other new mode is called global soft mode. This one happens here. Like this is completely determined by the soft job uh, procedure. And since this mode is far away from this blue line here, this mode does not know about the mass of, of the jet. So this mode will only contribute to the kind of overall normalization of the spectrum in the end. And one can work out how the theta and the Z fraction for the global soft mode and the collinear soft mode by just working out the intercept of these lines. Like for example, for the global soft mode, we have this um, parametrization of the theta and the Z. And for the collinear soft mode, we have these kind of parametrizations of the theta and the Z. And uh, if, we, if one works out analytic uh, expression for the differential distribution, then this is just the uh, formulas. So again, um, as in the previous case, since this uh, collinear soft mode and the collinear mode are sitting at the ends of this measurement, we have a convolution here. Like this J represents this collinear mode, jet function. And this SC is the collinear soft function accounting for this mode here. And we have a convolution since they are sitting at the measurement line. And as I said earlier, this global soft mode only matters uh, as a normalization factor. So there is no convolution for this SG function here. And again, we have the hard function um, re representing the initial production of the quark called gluon parton. Okay, this is the soft job procedure. And now I'm going to define my collinear job in terms of the soft job. So collinear job is defined by two soft jobs where the second soft job is more aggressive than the first soft job, such that we have some remaining kinematic uh, phase space for radiation. And the jet mass in soft job, uh, sorry, the jet mass in collinear job is defined by the difference of two soft job masses. And here in this plot, I have two soft jobs. The soft job one represented by this orange line here and the soft job two represented, represented by this um, magenta line here. And I take the difference. And in the picture, what we're going to take is this remaining regions between these two dashed lines, kind of a, a ring shape in the, in, the, in the cone picture. And we just take all particles inside this kinematic region and calculate their momentum squared. And that is what we call jet mass in collinear job. And the factorization formula in, in this case has been worked out in this paper. And basically there are four relevant modes matter here. We have a collinear soft mode from the first soft job and a second collinear soft mode from the second soft job. Like before we have a jet function, we have a collinear mode here, but that one has been groomed away by this uh, second soft job. So these two modes contribute to the convolution here. And again, we have two global soft functions here, one from the first soft job and the, another one from the second soft job. And they only matter in the overall normalization of the distributions. And the people have worked out these factorization formulas, which I'm not going to repeat here.
So what we're going to do is to use this jet mesh and construct the pure quark and the pure gluon observables. Okay. And uh, um, I think before we had to the kind of construction of those observables, let me quickly go through the analytic formulas for the factorization, just to get everybody uh, on the same page. So the factorization formula basically includes two pieces. One part, a kind of a normalization factor. It, it, it is independent of the jet mass, but it depends on the jet kinematics and the jet radius R. And then there's another piece that determines the shape of the spectrum. So it is dependent on the jet mass. And for the normalization term, people have worked it out. It involves the hard function and the two global soft functions, as I explained earlier. And the global soft functions knows the collinear job parameters. So it depends on the betas and it also depends on the z-cut. And for the hard function in PP collisions, we just have the parton distribution functions from the protons and some partonic cross sections. And for the uh, shape part, the p term, we have a convolution of two collinear soft functions. They are sitting on the line of the measurement. That's why there is a convolution here. They are connected by this delta function. Okay, and. Uh, um, here are just some analytic formulas to calculate the global soft function and the collinear soft function. So basically at one loop, one can write down the analytic expressions for the global soft functions one and the second global soft function. And in these calculations, there are two theta functions involved. So the first theta function basically says the radiation has to fail the soft job procedure. And the second the theta function says the kind of parton or the radiation has to be inside the jet. Otherwise, they cannot be counted part of the jet. They don't contribute otherwise. So this theta function just accounts for that. They're inside the jet. And then people can calculate this at one loop and using the MS bar scheme to renormalize its quantities. And here are the renormalized results. And then we just obtain the renormalization group equation for these global soft functions. And then we can solve these renormalization group equations to, to kind of evolve these global soft functions from one scale to another scale. And we can repeat the similar exercise for the collinear soft functions. Again, at one loop, people can write down how to calculate these collinear soft functions perturbative and then renormalize them in the MS bar scheme in the Laplace space. And these are the renormalized um, results. And then we can obtain, again, the renormalization group equations for these collinear soft functions, which allow us to involve them from one scale mu to another scale, say mu prime. Okay, I'm going to kind of uh, just go through this very quickly. Uh, we're, we're, we're to use this rather than derive them here. And uh, then the next quantity that I want to introduce is cumulative jet mass distributions. So the cumulative distribution is defined by integrating over the differential distributions. So we have the differential distributions calculated previously, and then we just integrated over from zero to some value, say delta mc squared. And then I normalize it such that in the end, when delta mc squared goes to infinity, this cumulative distribution goes to one. This is just an arbitrary normalization here. And then as I have shown you, we have factorization formulas. We can write down the perturbative expressions for these cumulative distributions. And uh, in, in the final expression, we have both quark and gluon contributions. And the quark and the gluon contributions can have different fractions. And that is determined at next leading log determined by the hard function at the normalization uh, at tree level. And for the non-trivial part, um, the kind of resummation formula leads to these heavy formulas here. Um, let me just explain terms here. Like for these k terms, that depends on two scales. They are just the standard Sudakov double logs or Sudakov factors. But since in this kind of collinear procedure, we have a, a, a we have a difference between two soft jobs. So we will have both plus signs, for example, in this term and this term, and the negative signs. This is just a feature of the collinear job. Since the collinear job is a difference between two soft job observables, we have both plus signs and negative signs here. 
And uh, then we have some kind of uh, non stockhoff factors. They're just kind of uh, powers written in this way. And finally, we have the jet mass dependence part here. And the K terms is just the double log integration and the omega terms is a single log. And uh, okay, now let us look at some results using these perturbative formulas. So here I just plot the purely perturbative contributions to these observables. Like the blue line is a quark contribution and the red line is a gluon contribution. And here I consider jet with 800 GeV in transverse momentum and it weighs a very small jet radius 0.2. And in the left case, I choose the two betas to be zero, and then I have two different Z cuts. And you see um, the curves, they're distinguishing as the mass becomes smaller, but after a while, they become uh, constant, like it is flattened. And this also happens if we choose a different set of parameters. See, if I choose one for the beta one, zero for the beta two, and these two Z cut parameters, I have a qualitatively different behavior but again, these distributions becomes flattened in the small jet mass limit. And this kind of constant behavior here is very interesting in the collinear drop, because if we do the jet mass in soft drop, they would just go to zero eventually. But in collinear drop, they become a non-zero finite constant here. And this constant is interesting because it tells us the fraction of events where the two soft drop soft drop masses are equal, which means in that ring-shaped kinematic region, there is just no radiations. In, like these, these events just have no radiations in that ring-shaped region. And this constant just tells us the, the number of those fractions uh, with, with no radiations in, in, the, in the collinear drop region. And this is the key for our constructions later. So we're going to employ this constant behavior. And by taking linear combinations of different um, parameters, we can make one distribution zero, but the other distribution non-zero. And this is the whole idea of the constructions that I will elaborate uh, more later. But before we do that, um, I need to persuade you another thing. Um, that is non-perturbative corrections, because so far I'm only talking about perturbative calculations for these jet masses. But as you can see, if we go to such small jet masses in these regions, the physics will become non-perturbative here. And we have to take into account non-perturbative non corrections to these distributions. Otherwise, it, it will not work in practice. Okay, so... Um, to talk about non-perturbative corrections to the distribution in that small ma jet mass region, we need to look at the collinear cell functions again. And let us look at the solutions to the renormalization group of the collinear cell functions. This is just the solutions to the RGE. Like the RGE involves the collinear cell function from the initial scale mu1 to a different scale mu. And these are just like solutions. These, these are just from the solutions of RGE. Um, but to do the calculations, we need to pick up a natural scale mu1 to do this kind of fixed order calculations for this term. And how should we choose this mu1? And let us look at this boundary terms here. This boundary term depends on mu1 and some other combinations of scales. Like if we want to minimize these boundary terms or minima, minimize the perturbative corrections to this one, we want to minimize this log here. And this just gives us a natural choice for this mu one. So we want to choose the mu one such that this log term vanishes. And this choice would, would do that. So we want, so this term by, by choosing this uh, as the mu one, this log becomes zero. But quickly you realize there would be a problem because this scale depends on the jet mass. And if we look at very small jet mass regions, this scale becomes non-perturbative. And when that happens, you cannot trust these perturbative constructions anymore. You, the non-perturbative corrections, the RGE will become significantly important. So that means we have to stop the running at some perturbative scales. And uh, um, 
uh, and we are going to see the consequence if we stop running at some perturbity scales on the next slide. So to account for the non-perturbity corrections in that small jet mass region, you know, we use a model that is based on the shape function. So basically we convolute the perturbative near saw function with some non-perturbative functions. And this non-perturbative function F is called a shape function. And the most important uh, uh, part for the shape function is that it is Z-cut independent. And that has been shown in this paper here. And this, uh, it, we will heavily rely on this fact, this independence of the Z-cut. And once we write down this kind of convolution formulas, which includes both the perturbative contributions and the non-perturbative contributions, we can go to the Laplace space and then these two pieces kind of factorize, and then we can use our RGE to kind of connect this um, perturbative part to the perturbative part at a, a very small scale. And here I just involve the collinear solve function from the lambda CS1 to some scale uh, mu. And uh, here I did for one of the collinear solve functions, you can repeat the procedure for the other collinear solve function. And in this way, we just defined a shift function in the MS bar scheme. So the, this is the original shift function. And in the MS bar scheme, we basically just absorb boundary term in the collinear solve function into the shift function. And we call that a MS bar shift function. And uh, here I choose an arbitrary perturbative scale called lambda CS to stop the perturbative running. And in practice, this lambda CS dependence in the formulas will be canceled between the perturbative shift functions and the non-perturbative, sorry, between the perturbative collinear solve function and the non-perturbative shift functions. So the results will be lambda CS independent in the end. This is just some mathematical model to account for the non-perturbative physics. And then we can look at our cumulative distributions after we include the non-perturbative corrections. So now we have uh, one more piece in our formulas. So before we only have FG and this is sigma, and now we have this F term here. And again, this sigma term accounts for the RGE solutions. So we have some pseudocode factors and some uh, single log terms here. And this F is new here. This F includes the non-perturbative corrections. And this non perturbative correction basically just like uh, a kind of combination of these two uh, shape functions with a theta function constraining the kinematic space. And in practice, we're going to choose the two kind of collinear non perturbative soft scales to be the same and choose them to be perturbative such that we can still trust the perturbative calculation of the RGE. And the final results will be, will be independent of this choice because the dependence will be canceled by the non-perturbative shape functions. Okay, so this completes my, the first part of my talk, which is to tell you the kind of um, observables that we're going to use in the construction of pure quark and pure gluon observables. And now let me move on to the interesting part of the talk which is to really construct the pure quark and the pure gluon observables. Okay, so here is the general strategy of the construction. So we take the cumulative jet mass distributions in collinear job, which I have spent some time explaining. We take these cumulative distributions and then we form linear combinations of these cumulative distributions with two sets of collinear job parameters. So we have two sets of Z-cut parameters. I call it set A and set B. But the betas used in the collinear job is the same for the set A and set B. So here are the observables that we're going to work with. So the kind of pre-pure quark observable involves a cumulative distribution in the B set minus the cumulative distribution in the A set but with a near combination coefficient here, which is going to determine it later. And this pre-pure gluon observable has similar structures. We have a linear combination, but with a different linear combination coefficient, CQ here. 
So once we write down these linear combinations, what we are going to do is to find values of the linear combina combination coefficient, for example, the CG here, such that the gluon contribution to this quark observable vanishes. Okay? Mathematically, that just means we take the B set, subtract the A set with the linear combination coefficient CG, and we require this combination to be zero. And similarly, we can repeat this procedure for the pure gluon observable. We pick up the linear combination coefficient CQ, such that the quark contributions to this observable G vanishes. Uh, in general, these linear, combina linear combination coefficients will depend on the jet mass. But the key here is to kind of adjust, or, or adjust some terms in the linear combination such that these coefficients are independent of the jet mass, and such that they're, which means they're universal. Like once you determine at one point, it, it works everywhere. That that's the whole idea. And now I'm going to show you. That is, that is not a guarantee, right? It's independent. Uh, I mean, you can you can verify whether, but is that always guaranteed? That's independent or the. Yeah, that, that that's what I'm going to do. Um, you, we, we need to do some rebinning of the jet mass. That, that's why in these formulas, um, the jet mass A and B are different in general. So which means in practice, once we have two distributions, we need to kind of rescale one distribution and shift it uh, uh, to, to, to make this happen. I, I, yeah, I mean, I I'm just, just looking at this equation and both of the, you know, on the two terms, each equation that depend on the mass, right? Yes, yes, uh, exactly. And then yeah. by solving this equation, it's not a guarantee that C will be independent of the mass. Yes, right, right, mm. right. They, they, this is the claim. I'm going to make them independent, but okay. so far on this page, it, 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 it hasn't happened yet. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, that, that, that is what I'm going to do on the next slide. Um, Sorry, I, I, I have a question. question. Sure. Um, so here you determine the size by this condition with these two conditions. Uh, what about the Zs? So you have, you say you have two sets of parameters for these Z cuts. Mm -hmm. right? How do you yeah. determine those? Oh, the Z is a frame parameter you can choose in your construction of the collinear job. Like basically you can choose whatever Z you want. Um, and, yeah. and, uh, and this um, fact that the size are independent of uh, delta M works for uh, any combination of Zs? Uh, it, it turns out three of the Zs will be independent and one Z is constrained by, by this okay. condition. Yeah, I'm going to show you how it works. Okay, thank you. Sure, yeah. Let, let, let's move on to, to, to the most important part, uh, which is to make this CG and the CQ mass independent. And as Xinian pointed out, this CG and the CQ are mass dependent in general, and the dependence is through this F function here because the F depends on the jet mass. And what we're going to do is to make the arguments of the Xi functions the same in the A set and the B set. And if, we, if, we, if you write down the arguments of the Xi functions, it turns out this would be the conditions to make the CG and the CQ mass independent. So you require some parameters in the A set times the jet mass in the A set to be equal to the parameters in the B set times the jet mass in the B set. And you have two constraints because we have two collinear solved functions. And if, if you solve these constraints, you will find the jet mass in the B set is related to the jet mass in the A set by this condition, like it involves some Z cut um, scaling here also depends on the beta. And also one of the Z cut, which is the Z cut two in the B set, is determined by the three by the other three z cuts here in this relation. So it turns out that you can choose the beta in whatever way you want, and you can choose these three z cuts in whatever way you want. But the last z cut is determined by this relation here. And once you determine these the kind of parameters, the relation between the two jet masses are also kind of fixed by this relation. And once we we use these two conditions then you can show that the shape functions becomes a common factor, they are equal. And then in the pure quark and pure gluon constructions, 
you can take the shape functions out as a common factor and that becomes in the, uh, that, that that becomes a common factor and now if you require uh, the the say the gluon contribution vanishes here you will have an expression like this and similarly for the quark case and then these these capital sigmas can be calculated purely perturbatively and you can show it is jet mass independent in, in the non perturbative region and it also works in the perturbative region. Like you can use the perturbative region formulas and taking these formulas and explicitly show it is mass independent and it becomes universal. So here are the expressions at next leading log. Um, here, the expression of the linear combination coefficients only involves the global soft scales. It is independent of the jet mass. It depends on the Z kind of parameters and the betas, but it is independent of the jet mass. And also it is scale independent, like mu independent. Like once you determine the, these global soft scales, this number is fixed. And here I show you this kind of linear combination coefficients uh, for the case beta one equals beta two equals zero for two sets of uh, Z kind of parameters. For example, uh, let us look at the dash land first. So I choose the Z-cut 1 to be 0.1 and the Z-cut 2 to be 0.15 in the A set. And then you can see the, 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 the quark uh, C and the gluon C are very close to each other here. Like the, these two dash lines are almost over, overlap with each other. This is not a good sign because if you want to construct pure quark and pure gluon observables to separate quark and the gluons, you want these two numbers to be largely different such that in your experimental constructions, you don't need to do any fine tuning. Like the, the, the larger the separation, the better the disentangling power. So which means um, the Z-cut one, the Z-cut two in the A set cannot be too close to each other. And that is kind of proved or, or demonstrated by the solid lines here. So in these solid lines, we choose 0 0.05 and 0 0.4, which is largely separated. And if we look at this region, for the Z-cut one in the B set, you see that the black solid line and the red solid line are largely separated. For example, in one case, you can have 2.2, and in the other case, you just have 1.5. So, which means if we use these two linear combination coefficients in our constructions, we don't need to do any fine tuning, like the observables are already separated largely. So this will lead to some constraint when we choose these parameters. And I'm going to discuss how to choose these parameters to maximize the disentangling power. So it turns out that there are four constraints. Can I ask choose... one quick question, Shaojin? Sure, yeah. So what about the dependence on the um, initial scale variation? What, what, what do you mean by initial scale variation? So you, if you, you go to the, estimate? like canonical scale, if you try to vary yeah. the... Yeah, good. Yeah, like these mules are yes. kind of the, the, the scale you choose to do the fixed order calculation for the global solve function. And you can vary these scales by a factor of two, right? Like you have a canonical scale for the global solve function. You can vary that by a factor of two and that will lead to an uncertainty in these CG coefficients. And so that you will do be still have that dependence on the CG? Yes, here I only show you the central values, but right, in right. practice, we have the uncertainty band for this. Yeah, because this band, um, you, you also need to take that into account in your experimental construction, right? Like you, you just tell your experimental friends, these are just the CG values with some um, uncertainties and in the construction, they will include the uncertainties. Could you this roughly comment on the size of the uncertainties of these? Sure, the, the perturbative you, like uncertainties- for instance, you want these uh, CG and CQ to be pretty far apart from each other, you said, right? Is that something that you can separate yeah, you, you, within the uncertainties? Very well separated um, uh, for the CG and the CQ if you choose this set of parameters. Mm -hmm. So the perturbative mm -hmm. uncertainties for the CG is very small. And yeah, already okay. at next leading off, yeah. Thank you. Sure, okay, so yeah, now let me discuss how to optimize the parameters in the collinear jaw to maximize the disentangling power. So it turns out there are four relevant uh, 
the issues that we need to take into account. So first, for our constructions to work, right, we have a perturbative calculation of this CG. The global soft scales has to be highly perturbative, which means the canonical scale for the global soft function has to be much bigger than the lambda QCD. And the global soft scale is written in this way, depends on the PT of the jet, the R, the radius of the jet, and the Z-card parameters. So this will lead us, lead us, to, a, lead us to a constraint on the Z-card in terms of the PT and R. And the second constraint comes from um, the plot I just showed you. We want the z cut one and the z cut two in the A set to be largely separated, such that the CQ and the CG are largely separated, and we don't need to do fine tuning in the construction. And we also need the z cut one in the A set and the z cut one in the B set to be largely separated, demonstrated by this separation here. And the third constraint actually comes from the kind of contamination of some external soft radiation or underlying events. For example, in PP collisions, there are soft radiation contamination coming from the initial state radiation. And also from the underlying events, there are multi-parton interactions. Both of these can contaminate the kind of jet mass we constructed. And we want to significantly remove these contaminations. Otherwise, our perturbative calculations just become screwed up. And to kind of remove these contaminations, we can do two things. The first thing is focus on jets with a very small jet radius. And the hope is that with a very small jet radius, the soft contamination is largely removed. And the second choice is to look at is to work with jets with relatively large radius, say radius on the order of one, but use a very aggressive um, kind of cleaner job to remove these soft contaminations. For example, uh, we, we showed that if you want to remove the ISR and MPI for jets with a radius on the order of one, you need the Z-cut one for both A and B to be larger than 0.15. And this is very kind of, strict um, con uh, constraint, because this one will challenge the second constraint and kind of push us to, to a kind of parameter space that we don't want to go. And, and finally, the last constraint is that for our factorization formulas to work, we need the Z-cut I parameter to be much smaller than one. And you can see that the second constraint and the fourth constraint are kind of pushing against the third constraint if we choose large radius jet. And that's why in the following of my talk, I will focus on jets with smaller radius. But in the paper, we also discuss this case. And if, you, if you're interested, you can ask me about that. But from now on, I will only focus on small jet radius. And let us look at some analytic results here. So we pick up the jet PT to be 800 GV as a side small jet radius, jet radius equals 0.2. And we choose these parameters as the cleaner job parameters. And here are the results. So here we show both the partonic results and the, and the results with the shape function included, which means um, the non perturbative effects is included. So let us look at the partonic results first. So in this pure quark observable, we have the quark contributions vanishing, uh, sorry, uh, non-zero, and we have the gluon contributions vanishing. And the band here are just the perturbative uncertainties when we calculate these observables. These uncertainties include the uncertainties of the linear combination coefficients, as Kyle has asked. It also includes uh, perturbative uncertainties in the perturbative calculations of other pieces in the formula. As you can see in this plot, by using these parameters, the quark contribution and the gluon contribution are largely separated, right? The non-vanishing one is largely separated from the vanishing one, even if we take into account the perturbative uncertainties. And similarly for these pure gluon observables. And then let us look at the results with the non-perturbative effects or the shape functions included, which means we will look at these shaded bands here. So again, in a large kinematic regions, the vanishing component is largely gapped from the non-vanishing component. But after we include these non-perturbative shape functions, 
you see that the kind of distribution is no longer a constant. It gradually uh, goes to zero in the end. It goes to zero for both the quark case and the gluon case. And the reason is the following. So the shift function accounts for some non-perturbative soft radiations in the kinematic space. And when we require the jet mass, say, go to very uh, small uh, value, say zero in the end, this just limit the phase space for those non-perturbative salt functions. And the shift function will just go to zero in that limit because there is no more phase space for the non-perturbative physics to radiate. That's why it vanishes in the end and that vanishing for both cases, okay? This is the constructed observables only in the non-perturbative region. And now let us look at these observables in the whole kinematic region. Right? We start from the perturbative regions and we gradually move to the non-perturbative regions. And again, I use the same set of uh, collinear job parameters, again, with small jet radius and the large PT. And let's look at both the pure quark and the pure gluon observables here. So um, again, both of them will start at some constant values. This is just represents the end of the spectrum. And then gradually this distribution starts to decrease. But for the quark contribution here, it never becomes zero. And uh, only in the end, in the deep non perturbative region, this quark contribution becomes zero. But for the gluon contributions here, it decreases. And uh, once it hit a point, then our construction works and it becomes vanishing there. And it becomes vanishing after that throughout. So in these wide kinematic regions, this observables is pure quark. And the similar stories in this pure gluon observables here. So again, we start with some values and both contributions are distinguishing, but the quark contributions here becomes vanishing after a certain point and it becomes constantly vanishing after that. So in this case, yes, we have a pure gluon observables. Okay, um, yeah, I'm going to show you the Monte Carlo results, then I'm done. So, so far I'm only talking about the perturbative calculations and let us check this, how these ideas work in some Monte Carlo studies. So here is a Monte Carlo study based on Pythia and using the next leading log predicted linear combination coefficients. And immediately you see that it's, it's, it's not working perfectly in the Monte Carlos. For example, in the pure quark case, Yes, the gluon contribution is decreasing, but it never hits zero here and it becomes constantly vanishing. While for this pure gluon observables, the quark contribution is decreasing, but then it has some weird oscillating behaviors here, uh, which could be a problem in the, in the Monte Carlos. So these plots just indicate that the Monte Carlos, such as PCA, may not be very well tuned to describe the soft radiations in these regions. It, like the, the Monte Carlos are not tuned to match the collinear job factorization calculations. And this will have two consequences. So first, the, our determination of the linear combination coefficients may be different in the Monte Carlo studies from the perturbative studies. And the second impact is the shape of the spectrum may be distorted in these Monte Carlo studies. So to further explore the effects of the, the first point here, we try to kind of change those linear combination coefficients by ourselves and try to make these observables pure quark and pure gluon. And let us look at what would happen if we do that. So by adjusting these linear combination coefficients, totally based on the Monte Carlo studies, we can make the pure quark observable work. Uh, though the behavior is different from our perturbative predictions, like we have some oscillating behavior here, that like you first go to a dip and then you comes back and then becomes constantly vanishing here. So in a less rigorous sense, we still have constructed a pure gluon, uh, sorry, pure quark of the walls here, and it works in a wide kinematic region. But it, it, it didn't work out for the pure gluon of the walls. And the reason uh, we think is because in Pythia or in Monte Carlo generators such as Pythia, the kind of jet mass per metric scaling of the distribution is different between the quark jet and the gluon jet just inside, the, just inside the Monte Carlos. 
that the Monte Carlos predicts the pure quark of the world works here, which means the gluon distribution works in the same way as in our factorization formulas. But the pure gluon of the robots does not work here, which indicates that the quark jet inside the PACIA has a different parametric scaling from the factorization formulas. So you already see there is some kind of inconsistency between quark jet and the gluon jet inside PACIA. And that should be explored in the future studies. And finally, um, I want to talk about the ISR and MPI contaminations. So, so far, these plots have no initial state radiation or multi-particle interaction effects. And as I said earlier, a very small jet radius will help us to get rid of the ISR and MPI effects. And that is indicated by this plot here. So, for example, if you look at this gluon differential distributions in collinear drop, you find the PCR results with the ISR and MPI both on is not too different from uh, the case with both off. And it turns out that uh, the, the kind of difference between VCA and the PCA is already on the same order between the ISR on and the ISR off. So which means the kind of soft contamination effect here is very small and it's, it's comparable with the difference between different Monte Carlo generators. But a different situation happens with a relatively large radius jet. For example, for the gluon jet with jet radius 0.5, you see the red line and this black dash line are, are very different in these regions here, right? The, the blue line goes to very sharp here and goes down very quickly, while the black dash line has a di very different behavior here. And this indicates that the soft contamination from the initial state radiation and the multi-party interaction are still there inside the jet. And that will ruin the construction of the pure quark and the pure gluon observables. That's why in practice, when we, when we construct these pure quark and pure gluon observables, we focus on small jets, a small radius jets. Okay, finally, I just want to show you um, the results after we include the initial state radiation and multi-particle interaction effects. Again, we use the same linear combination coefficients as we used previously, but you see that since the ISR and MPI effects are largely groomed away, the soft contaminations does not destroy these observables here. I still have a very good pure quark observables here. And again, the pure gluon observable does not work. And as I explained, the reason is because inside the PACIA, the quark jet and gluon jet have different parametric scalings in the quark jet spectrum. And that leads to this kind of uncancellation behavior here, or this oscillating behavior here. Um, I mean, this difference uh, between quark and gluon jets in PACIA should be further explored in future studies. Okay, with that, um, I'll go to my conclusions. So in this talk, I show you how to construct pure quark and pure gluon observables by using collinear job grooming technique. And the construction basically is based on linear combination of two different cumulative distributions in collinear job. And we choose different z card parameters and we rescale the jet masses such that the linear combination coefficient becomes mass independent and thus universal. And we also show that um, this construction is robust against the non-perturbative corrections. And then I show you some Monte Carlo studies. Uh, as I said, to remove the ISR and MPI effects, we need to focus on jets with small radius. And uh, we, I, I, I show you that the pure quark of the walls works, but the pure gluon of the wall does not work. And it suffers from a different parametric scaling in the quark jet. Uh, from the factorization formula predicts. And finally, I want to comment that um, since this is one of, one of our original motivations to, to separate quark from gluon jazz. So if we want to apply this idea to heavy ion collisions, we have uh, another source of soft contaminations in heavy ion collisions, which is a median response. Like when jazz traverses the quark gluon plasma, it loses the energy. But those lost energy will end, some of the lost energy will end up inside the jet in the end. 
and we call that median response. So, so far, um, I don't think we know how the median response will change the jet mass in collinear drop, or how the collinear drop can get rid of the median response. So there are a lot of open questions remaining if we want to apply this construction in heavy ion collisions, which really motivates uh, more future works. Yeah, with that, I would like to thank your attention. And now I can take some questions. Well, thank you, Xiaojun, uh, for this very, very uh, clear talk. And uh, uh, I'm sure there should be some questions uh, as I have. Um, uh, please see if you have any questions, either just, you know, um, unmute and speak or just uh, raise your hand. Uh, sure, maybe, uh, maybe I'll go first then. Um, yeah, so th yeah, thanks. Yeah, James, James, go ahead. Hi, James. James. Yeah, yeah th thanks, Shredan, for, for the nice uh, and very interesting talk. So can you maybe go back to the slide where you showed your um, analytical results with like the perturbative, oh, sure. non-perturbative, right? This one? Yeah, yeah. So, so I'm wondering. So, I mean, if I understand correctly, kind of the key outcome of this is that you still have this like pure quark or gluon region, even when things are still perturbative. Um, yes. Right. But I'm wondering how far one can push this in kinematics. So here you have like very high PT jets. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that is the separation like? proportional to the PT or I mean is it feasible that you still get this kind of behavior if I go down to say 100 GeV or, or less? Good yeah good question so that is one of the constraints here so <clears throat> like um, these linear combination coefficients are kind of predicted perturbatively so we want the global soft scales to be perturbative and this is the first constraint here and you can see this constraint this constraint requires PT times R times the z-cut. So um, as I said, like we want to get rid of the initial state radiation effect. So we choose a very small jet radius. And that leads, that kind of force us to choose a very large PT to compensate for that. But um, I think it, I think certainly one can go to 500 GeV or 400 GeV, but for 100 GeV, um, I'm not sure. I think for if we choose 100 GeV here, we probably need to go to a slightly bigger jet radius to make this satisfied and consistent with other constraints. Um, yeah, um, but let's see, if we, choose, if we choose 100 GeV here, we can go to large radius. And as I said, there is a second kind of method to get rid of the initial state radiation of MPI, which is to use relatively large z cut. And uh, then one need to kind of work out this optimization first, um, kind of play this optimization game and then try to find the best parameters to kind of satisfy all the constraints. I, I think it's possible to go to 100G in, in short. I see, okay, thanks. Yeah, that, that will be interesting to, to see if we can get away with that, thanks. Sure. And the next, uh, Matias. Hi, Xiaojing. <clears throat> Thanks uh, for the very nice talk. And uh, yes, James asked one question I wanted to ask. The second question I have is about your Pythia studies. So mm -hmm. how do you define a quark or a gluon jet? There, there, are, there are a few ways to define a quark gluon jet in Pythia. And I'm wondering uh, which one you have chosen. And uh, I see. Know, OK, you thank you. The other yeah, way, I... you, you could get a slightly different result. So how much? Yeah. So um, uh, for quark, yeah, basically we just turn on the process where you have the PP goes to a quark plus a Z uh, or, or a photon. That, that's how we select the quark jet. Okay. And for the gluon jet, um, I think we pick up the same similar process. PP goes to gluon jet plus another Z boson. I see. So for you, when you tag the when you tag the jet, let's say it's it's the it's the leading outgoing parton. That's that what makes the jet. Yes, right. That's well, yes, that's the leading. Yeah, so my right. question is, uh, you know, if, if one could imagine that I have a, um, a gluon at the very beginning, but then it splits into the QQ bar pair, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, the rest of the shower kind of evolves like two separate quark jets. Right, mm -hmm. and um, so 
the my question is basically um, how does this correspond to 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 those considerations in Monte Carlo, right? I mean, uh, you know, is it still a blue one jet or is it already a quark jet? Let's put it this way. I see. Okay. And these two um, these two distributions will talk to each other. That's what that's that's what I'm, talk to each other meaning uh, you know some some features of it will 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 be common. Yes, right. Um, I, I think you were talking about I have a highly virtual gluon that splits into two a, a QQ example, bar. That's just an that example. Right? Bar is, and that QQ bar is not is not collinear, right? You have some large angle between the QQ bar, such that you can have, for example, a, a three jet event. It, 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 I, I don't know. I mean, these objects are. Um, are um, well, okay, yes, yes, of course, the, the, there is a split and there's an opening angle to, to that split. Yeah, and right, right. So the, the pro my problem is basically, we don't have such a luxury in experiment, mm -hmm. right, to differentiate mm -hmm. between, uh, only, only, of course, if we do the really Z, Z quark, uh, for example, events, right? For gluons, yeah, right. it becomes immediately immensely difficult, I mean, qu quite difficult to differentiate them. So have you thought about uh, sort of experimental predictions or prescriptions, how to measure those distributions in experiment? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have to think like it requires you to measure all the jets in one event. If you have, a, say, a jet event, then you know the process you just described does not happen, um, right? But mm -hmm. okay. if you have... Uh, if you have a three jet event, say, uh, like let's think about a gluon back to back, and then one gluon becomes the QQ bar, and the QQ bar forms two jet, then you will have three jets if you look at the kind of eta phi plane in the end, right? So I think if we want to apply these procedures, just get rid of those three jet events and focus on the two jet events. I see. Okay. And of course, we all know we're not measuring partons in the experiment, but other. <laughs> yes. Know, right. Oh, yeah. Hydrons. I've got to mention so like of this, this, this additional issue, right? How to tag the. Uh, so let me let me mention just another operational definition. What is a quark and gluon jet? And sometimes it's very, sometimes it's quite often used uh, that you essentially uh, look for uh, for uh, um, on a partonic level, even on, in Monte Carlo, you target jet quark or gluon, depending on what's the highest energy parton you captured within your R of your jet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It doesn't it always has to be the, the original uh, parton, but uh, I mm -hmm. wonder how those distributions would, uh, uh, would change with that requirement, but maybe that's, that's just academic. Oh, I see. So, so you're... So you're saying if you have a quark initial jet, but that quark really out a very energetic gluon, so it, 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 that kind of the process you're yeah. you're seeing, you're discussing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Let's let's uh, let's. Yeah, I, I I don't know how to deal with that case. Yeah, Fair but enough. that's a very good point. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias. Uh, Wei Qing. Uh, hi, Xiaojin. Very nice talk. Uh, I have maybe two naive questions. If you can go back maybe to slide 30 or 29 when you have the uncertainty for the calculation. Sure. So yeah. I guess here the idea is to really like have like uh, uh, add significant separation that's possible between the quark and gluon. And right. here like, on the left-hand side plots like uh, zero versus 0.3 and on the right is zero versus 0.15. I'm wondering, yeah. can you push it even further? Like, you know, have even a bigger separation by, you know, changing the combination or the uh, Z cut, is that possible? Yes, yes, um, it, it, it's possible. For example, if you, if you choose uh, if you choose this one to be 0 0.01, mm -hmm. this will be further separated. Uh, and also, if you choose higher PTs, this will also be further separated. Yeah. Okay. 
So, so in principle, one can like keep playing with these parameters to achieve, uh, let's say, the largest yes, yes. separation right. possible. Right. Right. Okay. Here we only pick up one set of parameters, but in practice, it is a game that um, <laughs> that both theorists and experiments needs to play. Like you have these constraints, and you just choose the best to maximize that gap. Mm -hmm. I see. Thank you. And then my last question is: Is it possible to do to apply this observable on the charge jet? rather than, you know, all, all the component, all the particles inside a jet. Uh, what, what do you mean? Oh, you mean, you, you mean only charge the particles inside yes, a jet? Yes, only charge particles. Um, yeah, I think, I think these factorization formulas does not, does not separate charged particles from neutral particles. I think you need to include both. Okay. Yeah, if you only focus on charged particles, that may end it up as some further constraints in the formulas. We, we, yeah, we, which I don't have a clear picture how that works. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, maybe it's in the shape function, like in the hydronization procedure, uh, you need something here. Yeah, I, I don't know. That definitely just introduce you more, some kind of extra fluctuation, I think. <clears throat> I see, okay, I see, okay. Because uh, they, the energy coming from the pattern to the charge particle, the fraction will change. I see. Okay. From you and you and yeah. I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah, Peter. Yeah, another uh, potential way to discriminate uh, quark gluon jets at the model level and maybe even experiment is to ask for a very hard leading heavy flavor. If you see a jet with a on the model level, with a uh, with a with a uh, B quark, or in uh, data with a um, with the leading B meson or D meson, um, mm -hmm. I, I haven't done the you know the pithy calculation, but uh, that might bias towards you know strongly towards initial uh, quark population, which is different than the definition you were using of a vector boson plus a plus a quark jet. Um, does your formalism apply if the quark, or how would you have to modify your formalism to, to uh, consider heavy flavor? Um, would there be, um, do you understand the, can you tell us like, the connection between what you presented here and if it were heavy flavor? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, um, the perturbity, I mean, this, the, 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 um, the, this perturbity parts, I think will remain what will change is these kind of non-perturbing pieces mm -hmm. because e, e, like these, these things happen at a scale about 5 GeV or 10 GeV, like for the global soft scales. Mm -hmm. But this process happens at way lower scales and the, in, in, the, in the heavy quark case, the heavy quark mass will play a kind of dominant role in, in the non-perturbing physics, for example, for the hydronization processes. So I think one needs to modify this piece for heavy quarks. Um, yeah. That might be um, an alternative kind of experimental program whereby you, you compare jets with the leading heavy flavor to just unbiased jets, which is a mixture. So that's already a uh, distinct population. I see. Yeah, OK. Yeah, that, that, that's a good point. I think, yeah, we can work out these formulas for heavy quark initiated jets. And then since, since you, you, you said experimentally, you have kind of better data if you tag a heavy meson. Oh, right? because so we're gonna have a lot of more data, but the problem is still the production mechanism of what we observe, right? Mm -hmm. so, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm not saying it's pure, I, I need some study, but it's, a, it's a, at least a, something to consider. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Yeah, heavy quark initiated gems. Yeah, something interesting. Yeah. Okay, uh, James, do you have another question? Uh, yeah, one one other question. Yeah. Um, so, uh, kind of stepping back a bit from the specifics of your calculation, I, I'm I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on um, kind of what properties or what specific types of observables one might be able to achieve this kind of behavior for. Um, so, like, Mateusz and I were actually thinking, I don't know, in the past year or two about some other substructure observables where we find that, you know, in the tails of the distributions, the quark and gluon get um, mm -hmm. kind of get this similar, like, you know, pure quark gluon thing. Um, yeah. 
we of course have no idea what's calculable or not. Um, but is there something specific about like collinear drop that allows you to do this, or can this in principle be done for certain like ungroomed observables or, or other jet observables? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, we 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 found this construction because we observed uh, this constant behavior here. Like once it becomes constant, you know if you form linear combinations, the linear combination coefficients is universal, right? In, in this constant region. But it, it turns out that our construction also works in the perturbative region. Um, so with that, I would imagine the same procedure can work in soft job jet mass. Um, yeah, you just repeat the same exercise, you form linear combinations, you put some constraint on the parametric dependence in the soft job jet mass, and you get some constraints. You basically, you, you need to kind of rebeam or you rescale your jet mass and, and then you can arrive at some pure quark or pure gluons. Yeah, that, that, that is my guess, but we, we, we didn't work that out, yeah. What do you mean by it works also in the region where it's non-constant? Yeah, for example, here, right? They, this negative four is still in a perturbative region, but it already works there. You, you using the same linear combina combination coefficient that we determined mm -hmm. in the non perturbative region. Right. So, so in that, uh, what the range of the region where it was not constant in that plot was from where to where? Like, ah, good. So, um, let, let me explain that in this plot. So, in this plot, right, you have the measurement, which is the blue line here. For smaller and smaller jet masses, uh, sorry, for larger and larger jet masses, this blue line is moving downward. Oh, I, I, yeah, I have a pin. Yeah, I can draw that. So, so sure. for bigger and bigger jet masses, this blue line is moving this way. And when the blue line hits here, you have some behavior change. And when the blue line here, this is the end of the spectrum. Okay, this line is the end of the spectrum. And this line is kind of a qualitative change here. And these two things would correspond to the changes in that plot. Um, yeah, for example, here, which means the, um, the, the A set, the, the A, the, we have two sets, A and B, the A hates the end of the spectrum. And this one happens when the B hates the, 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 the upper global soft scale, the global soft scale one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, we kind of from that plot, we know why these, these behaviors change qualitatively. It corresponds to the end of the spectrum. Right, so between those, those uh, re ranges, uh, they are not completely separated, right? It's yeah, yeah, this region, um, what I can see is in, in these regions, the A set is changing with mass, but the B set is constant. That, that's why you, you, can have, you cannot have this behavior here. But once you hit this point, both A and the B sets are changing non-trivially with the jet mass, and then they cancel. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So in other words, the parametric dependence on the jet mass in this region is different between A and the B. And that, so that's constant, why constant, constant region ends where in this plot? Uh, when when the when the B when the B set um, hates the first global soft function. Right. So it's at negative four. That where where your cursor is at. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's here. Right. So yeah. doesn't doesn't that mean that non-constant region it doesn't work? It, I mean in the non-constant region, you cannot separate them? Yeah, 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 yeah. Here, you cannot separate them. You, right, but you I, to look. right, I'm just confused about your remark that it will work for a regular soft drop mass as well. Because uh, I thought you were saying that it will work um, in the, like the non-constant 
Yeah, in, in the non-constant region, yes, right, right. Uh, but did, yeah. here, yeah. the non-constant region corresponds to re region between negative four and negative two, right? Oh, 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 you're asking that constant region. No, 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 it, it's, uh, sorry, I, I misunderstood your question. Like, the constant region is negative five. For example, uh, this see. is, yeah. So between um, negative five and four is you're saying it also works. Yes, right, right. And what, what is the reason for it working in that region too? Because like between negative five and six, as you say, you can intuitively just say there should be a linear combination such that you only have pure right. quark or pure gluon. But why does it right. work in this re right. region where there's a mass dependency? Yeah, that, that's, that is due to this mass rescaling between the A and B. So we derive this in the non-perturbative region considering the shape function, but it turns out um, the, in, in the perturbative region, you have the same parametric dependence on the jet masses. And these jet masses rescaling just gives you the same kind of pure quark or pure gluon observables. Mm, I see. So, yeah. so we didn't realize what really that matters is yeah. taking different observables and if it has this rescaling uh, property, then you can actually always apply this. Yeah, right, right, yeah. It doesn't have to be the non-perturbative region. All you need is it's this kind of rescaling behavior. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's why I guess in soft job, it, it could also work. Right. Okay. Um... Let me see any, I, I, you know, I also, this, we have, I think, okay, uh, we can stop here, but uh, if anybody want to stay, uh, we can stay and continue to discuss because I have a couple of questions to ask, but, you know, we already passed by. Let's yeah. thank uh, Xiaojun again uh, for this great talk. Yeah. I, I do have a couple of questions here. Yeah. You, you have... Uh -huh. This uh, this this uh, parameter, this conceit, this you know, this fraction, is sort of uh -huh. pretty predetermined, right? Um, yes, it's and predetermined. this is uh, yeah. this predetermined by the kinematics and also soft drop kinematics, or is also rely on some kind of a theory. Ah, good. Of, it's... of, of, of branching. Uh, of branching. Yeah, I mean, how do you determine? Because I mean, is you know, for 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 example, if for, for experimental you know analysis, how do they construct this uh, you know observable oh, which you have to good. Yes. yes, right, right. So so in our perturbative constructions, we can calculate. Sorry, I go into wrong. Thing. We can calculate them at next leading log, or, or you can go to higher and higher orders. See, this is what and, I'm saying. This is a, it's calculated by. Yes. A particular theory. Yes, right. Is not something that they, you know, the, uh, you know, Peter or, or James or the amateurs that come up and, and then in the experiments they can sort of construct from their experimental observable. No, probably not. Uh, um, uh, yeah, I think there are two approaches. One is to take these perturbative estimates for the C, G. Yeah, and then construct their experimental observables. They can also they can also determine this CG using the data, um, and, and the way to do that is to kind of take take their measurements for the A set and the B set and uh, rescale the jet mass, right? To to like it, it, they have jet beans, mass, yeah, yeah. sorry, jet mass beans, and you need to rescale the beans, and when when the bean are kind of corresponding to each other in this way, they can take, um, um, let, let me see how to construct this CG. Um, yeah, they, they, can, they, can, they can solve the CG by making, uh, by making one of the distribution. How, how do they do that? Well, you, you, I mean, you, you solve the equation by because you know in a simulation what is the you know the contribution from the quark originated or gloom yes, originated. Right, right, but experiments right, yeah. you don't you don't know, right? Right. They, they don't know, right. Yeah. They yeah. 
as a theorist, I need to tell the experiments what are the CG values. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, right. so, so the, the reason I am asking you is this because, you know, for example, if you supposedly want to do this in heavy ion interactions, in heavy ion, you have, I mean, you can still do soft drop or stuff like that to get rid of the medium response. I think medium response is actually most of them are soft, you know, uh, particles. They, you can, you know, with right. soft drop, they will not enter. But you do have medium induced heart radiation, which will modify your theoretical calculation, you know, a formula for this uh, KCG. Mm -hmm. or KCG I see. Field, I right? see. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it will also modify this scaling, right? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But that, uh, you know, as you said, that may be the, uh, the experimental analysis they can, you know, they can look, they can, I can do this construction, but but not can see. Uh... I see. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So there are medium induced hard radiation. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Anyway, I mean, I think um, uh, again. But if you have a particular theory for hard medium induced radiation, you can you can also probably calculate there too. It just how it becomes model dependent uh, procedure. I see. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. 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 Thank you very much. Uh, it's great talk. Great. Great. Uh, thank you. To yeah. yeah. Listen to your thank talk. You okay. <laughs> thank you again. Let me. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Let me stop the recording.